Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. It's Alex Greenwood. You know, it is a testament to what an enjoyable time our guests have on this show when they actually come back. <laughs> we, we've got a few who've done that, and this is someone who I'm tremendously thrilled to report is returning after appearing in 2017. It's Mickelson. He is a grammy balloted musician, producer, singer, songwriter. He's got a new album coming, and he's been doing a lot of stuff since the last time we spoke in August of 2017. And I thought it was time we checked into this San Francisco-based artist and just uh, see what's what. So welcome, Scott Mickelson, to Mysterious Goings On. Hi, thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me back. It's a little different not not uh, having breakfast with you, but I'll do the best I can. <laughs> it was so good that time. Yeah, actually, when you toured through here, folks, he, uh, he hung out uh, with us, and uh, it was a blast. Had a great time. I, I think I was hung over for three days, but otherwise, it was, it was still a great time. So what's been going on since then? Now, I, I know you've got a new album coming out. You just hit, hit the high notes for us, would you? Well, uh, and the last time I saw you was right before my previous record, A Wondrous Life, came out. And that record was, uh, I, I was really happy with how that all worked out. I had played most of the instruments and had done it all myself, the recording, the mixing, everything. So it was a real Mickelson effort, in, uh, as opposed to having a lot of guest musicians. And really the thinking at that point was that I'd become begun to get so busy with producing other artists i didn't have the time to schedule extra sessions to do my record so i was just kind of going in and recording two hours here three hours there whatever i could get in and and just enjoy doing everything myself which i hadn't done since you know the fat opie days years ago um and then i i toured all over the country with that and also did my first european tour mm. Uh, with that, uh, I, I started getting press in the Netherlands and in Germany and uh, went over and did shows there and uh, came back. And what else did I do? Right before that, I had done a, a compilation, a benefit compilation called After the Fire, Volume 1, which raised money for the people who had lost their homes in the Northern California fires. Um, and that 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 did really well. We raised uh, probably by now maybe six thousand um, dollars, mm-hmm. which went to two charities in Sonoma County. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's it's just really hard to get people to pay <laughs> for money <laughs> these days. And then uh, I, after that came out and my record came out, I got asked to do a compilation for blanketthehomeless.org. Um, which this time I had a bit of a budget and I was able to ask uh, a new group of, of, of uh, artists. Some of them were fairly well-known artists. One of them was Fantastic Negrito, uh, who was a two-time Grammy winner. And uh, the LP did, did okay. It's still available. And just go to, you know, blanketthehomeless.org. It's, it was created as a double LP and it's, it's really good. It's, it's all, it's uh, 13 out of the 15 tracks were all tracks that I recorded here. And I'm super proud of that. And then uh, it came time for me to do my own record and tour. And I've been fairly compromised time-wise to do my record. And I needed to stop my own touring where right now I'm supposed to be in Seattle playing, but I'm yeah. not. And I needed to have product in Europe at this time And knowing that I wanted to do an LP, you need about six months to manufacture LPs. So I had to, long story short, it ended up being only seven new tracks plus a live track, an eight song uh, LP, uh, because I was rushing to meet a deadline, even though I had more songs written. And then of course the deadline is is (laughs) fictitious because of the COVID. So I have this eight song, uh, LP coming out called Drowning in an Inflatable Pool. Yeah. And uh, I, again, I played most of the instruments on this, but what, what I what I really like about this record is because I was returning to it intermittently, it was always really fresh. So every time I went to a track, I, it could have been weeks in between. I, it was, you know, hey, this is a good song. I don't remember writing that. That's pretty cool. You know, I actually, it's one of the first records I've done where I, I actually enjoy listening to it when it's done. 
Um, and it, it, the writing of it began shortly after the 2016 election. So <laughs> I, I didn't know, I didn't know at this time, uh, what some of the, how some of these songs were going to resonate. Uh, one of the first songs I wrote for the record was called the lockdown. And I wrote that in 2016 and it was really after Trump was elected and what he was doing um, with his executive orders and uh, the undoing of every environmental law and everything that Obama did. I, to me at that time, the lockdown was that the, the country was in a lockdown. You know, we, this, we were kind of trapped in this environment where we, uh, Congress had no say. And, and of course, now that the record's coming out during a lockdown, it, it seems, <laughs> It seems poignant, um, sadly. Okay, you're blowing my mind because I listened to that and I thought you must have written that towards the tail end here. I See, <laughs> I, I thought the lockdown was literally there because there, it's a fairly, uh, if you listen to the lyrics, folks, and you must get this album when it comes out, it, it's very apocalyptic, uh, the imagery you elicit here. So you're telling me this was something you wrote in 16? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I actually, I was performing it solo on banjo in 2017. Yeah, oh my or maybe gosh. 2016, yeah, 2016, yeah. Uh, yeah, the words, yeah, have made, they make no reference at all to- No. Disease, you know, to COVID or that kind of thing, but it's, you know, the oppression is oppression and, and it, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to recite lyrics unless I'm stopped from the beginning, but it, it holds up. Um, Actually, I kind of felt weird putting it on the record because I didn't want it to seem like I was cashing right. in. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it, the, the, you know, it was already the the record well, was already being manufactured before the the COVID. So, so well, so there is a line uh, in twenty four hours we'll all forget. Yeah, I was referring to, well, you know, Trump was so was so uh, almost, uh, um, I hate to say, immune, but he does these radical things and statements so quickly that every single day it's a new, it's a new deflection. It's yesterday. He said this today. He said this. So no matter what bullshit he puts forth tomorrow, we're not really going to remember it. The 24 right. hours we're going to forget. And he knows he's doing this. It's, right. it's, you know, don't look over here, look over here. And so that's what I was referring to in that line. Uh, and also you, the line, you know, the devil is at your door. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could be, yeah. Um, well, yeah. Well, you know me, Scott, I've always, I'd listen to, the, I'm very intense about the lyrics. And that's one of the things I, I absolutely love about your work. And I don't be mad at me and say I'm being a jerk by saying this, but I just been listening to the new Dylan album. And of course, Love and Theft. Jerk. I know you idiot. And, and it's, but I'm listening. And Love and Theft is one of my all time favorites by him. But I'm, I'm, dude, I'm serious. I see this. The way you use lyrical imagery, the way you craft your lyrics is really reminding me of what Dylan's been doing a lot in the past 20 years. Not saying you're doing it because of him at all. Not saying that. I'm just saying, though, that it's reminiscent of that for me, which just warms the cockles of this writer's heart. I love it because you conjure up all this imagery. It's just interesting because, you know, don't, this is from a previous album, but don't buy the trailer if you can't back it up. And you've got all these other things where you, you seemingly, in, in less skillful hands, you would be jamming things together. And in your previous interview with us in 2017, you talked about how you do the music first, but you write down phrases and things that come to your mind and then you go scavenge through those scraps and you put them together are you still doing that yeah that's the only way i write i don't i don't have any other method um i i don't i don't sit there and write words and take note like like i don't know i mean i could show you i probably <laughs> well the the people listening can't see it but yeah like um yeah you can see this is what i do Holy cow. So he's showing me some, just some scratch paper and there's, there's, uh, there's lines and lines you've written, you've, you've scratched. Now what is, there's several lines you've scratched through of your handwriting. What does that mean? That means I've used it in a song. So I don't <laughs> think it's okay. 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 You know, I got to tell you something. I do the same thing for my books. 
ah, oh, this is, I shouldn't tell people this because I find a line I like, or I hear something or a turn of phrase, I'll just write it down and then I'll somehow try to work it into a book later. I just think that's, that's fun. And that's a good part of the process. So it yeah. thrills me to see that you're continuing to, to, to do that with your own process. I just, you know, I, I don't, I've been writing songs and I know it sounds weird, but I've been writing songs for 50 years now. I mean, so I, I, I don't really, I, I, uh, I'm not one of these guys who I get in a mood and, you know, I'm really deep right now and I need to sit down <laughs> and write. I mean, I, I'm sure I have written songs in that way, but that's just too much pressure to sit there and say, okay, now I have to write, you know, uh, it's like, it would be like an artist going up to a can, a blank canvas mm -hmm. and just say, okay, paint a picture and have it not be abstract. Um, I just, it's just not how I like to work. I, I, I get, I mean, because I've been doing this for so long, my motivation to write is I get sick of playing my old songs. Mm -hmm. So I need something new to play. And it's, it's, uh, it's more about the physicality of playing and singing the songs and that vibration that I crave. And when I want to play, I go, oh crap, I don't want to play this anymore. I really need to write something, just write new stuff for my own sake. Right. And, and then I eventually get some music, some, some riffs or melodies. And, and then I'm like, ah, oh, crap. Now I got to sit down and actually write the fucker. <laughs> and then I sit there and it, it, you know, it takes as long as it takes, it, it, you know, it's, it's usually a few days, you know, maybe 10 days at top. So I don't, I've learned over time not to, not with any placeholder lines, you know, where you, you do your first draft and you, you have to be honest, you know, is this a placeholder line is, you know, every lyric has to be perfect. And there's only so many lines on a song. So it's not like writing a novel as a, as a songwriter, if you're only, you know, writing 15 or 18 lines, they should all be perfect in my opinion. Well, and of course I think you succeed. So let's, let me walk back for a second here. So you were Grammy balloted for flickering. Mm -hmm. for, for for folk and for roots music i believe well, uh, it was for best folk artist for the okay. record and uh best roots music performance for hercules and iron man, iron man. okay so that there that was the style of flickering then you took it to uh, a wondrous life where you know you're a big banjo guy which i love but there's more electric guitar on a wondrous life as i recall yeah you kind of decided to go that I'm not saying there wasn't any banjo, but there was a lot more electric yeah. guitar, right? I, yeah. I mean, I had a band for, for 20 years called Fat Opie. We were very rock. Um, we, we began really like grungy rock. Um, and that's when we got signed to Neil Young's management and all that. Uh, and then the, one of the last records we did became very alternative and, you know, uh, uh, let's see. Was it, uh, it was it Victoryville? No. No, my favorite band, you know, Tom oh. York, Radiohead. Oh, Radiohead, sure. And Radiohead was was really exploding, and it was hard not to be influenced by what they were doing. And, and so I made a, a record called uh, Airstream, uh, with Fat, a Fat Opie record called Airstream, which I still think is a great record. And that was, I think, A Wondrous Life is very similar to that, and the way I use loops and a lot more electric mm. guitar and a, little, a lot more complexity. Um, but the, and I, I, you know, yeah, I guess, I guess it is similar. Yeah. Similar. Well, uh, yeah. so it wasn't a new thing. It was a new, it was newer because I hadn't done it in a while. Right. And that, that one had uh, the song that we played uh, last time you were on uh, crazy is the only place for a saint, which yeah. I love, uh, but the whole, the whole album's fantastic. No such luck is great. Um, some of the great cuts. I remember though, I was so, um, I was so, I, I get in these ruts. It's not a rut, bad rut to be in, but I find something I love. So I was playing flickering all the time and I was sharing it on social. I finally, what time you, 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 you ping me back on Twitter. Said, you know, dude, I got, I got a new album out. <laughs> yeah. That's a typical line is, you know, you know someone was uh, like, I'll send a record to like a good friend and, and I'll say, yeah, I, I like this song. And I'll say, Oh great. You hit all the other ones. <laughs> It's it's just a thing. 
No, that's okay because I've got eight books and uh, I'm, I always say, they always say, well, I just love blank. And I'm like, well, what about the first one? Yeah. Nobody ever says they love the first one. <laughs> so, oh. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> uh, there's six or seven more after that. Um, so, so, but, but if we carry this going forward though, so you went from more of a folk edge to a more alt rock edge, where are we with drowning? What, where are drowning in the uh, inflatable pool? What kind of sound are we talking about? Here? Well, I, you know, it's, I didn't write, I'm trying to think now. Um, well, uh, Jagged Tooth, the first single, mm -hmm. which I'm super, super excited about. Yes. Uh, July 15th and, excuse me, July 25th. And I have an animated video coming out two days before on July 23rd. And that'll world premiere on in uh, uh, American Songwriter. Mm. So that'll be cool. The video is great. And that, that song, uh, lyrically, I mean... <laughs> Uh, again, I wrote this at least a couple of years ago, but, you know, the lying culture that we live in, it's like every day it's a battle of lies and I, I and how it's become so normal, how, yeah. how, you know, it was so shocking. Alternative facts was so shocking in 2016. And now it's every single thing out of Trump's mouth is a lie. I mean, and, and, half you know 40 50 percent of the population just accepts it and yeah oh yeah yeah it's uh so in in jagged tooth the 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 character every single thing that comes out of his mouth is a lie a deflection or an excuse and it was like it was like writing from trump's brain is that the, where the line is I was doing my best to tell you the truth but every time i cut my tongue on this jagged tooth is yeah. so is that from his that's from the perspective of the trump yeah. the trump character yeah oh okay and it's catchy as hell though by the way folks and and production wise i really wanted to you know i've been producing a lot i mean i've been producing much more than people see because uh, you know it's one thing when you do big records that get press and and have bigger names on it but i work with a lot of artists who uh you know, it's, it's not their first job and it, they don't have as much experience perhaps, and which puts me as a producer to task more to make a great record. And, and I love it. It's, it's, it, everything becomes more of a collaboration and, and I've just gotten really, really good at it. So by the time I go to do my record, you know, I've, my skill level increases, you know, it, it takes me, two and a half years in between records, I've spent thousands of hours producing in between. So by the time I do mine and I can really, you know, I'm not under any timeline, I can really use all my gear and all, all my time to experiment and do things. Uh, I actually did this video, this how-to video of Jagged Tooth. Did you see it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, <laughs> that, that was kind of a, a, a very quick way of showing, but um, so for that song, I really wanted to keep it much more minimal. On the, I tried to keep this record much more minimal, mm -hmm. um, uh, much less loops, less, uh, less playing with MIDI and experimenting, just more with more intent. Mm -hmm. So with uh, with Jagged Tooth, I had you know the the, the riff. Um, the, the, uh, So I just had that and I, you know, I had my drums from my drum in LA and I just went out to my twin and I grabbed my ribbon mics and I just made it, dialed it in exactly the way I wanted to hear it. You know, uh, maybe I was thinking like black keys or something. And Ooh, yeah. once I had that done, you know, my bass style is always, uh, I love Carol Kay and really just plucky. Actually, I think I did the bass through the Fender twin amp, you know, it was kind of like, not not a lot of experimenting. I just did it, and then the piano takes me forever because I'm not really a piano player. And then the vocals, um, you know, it's I always lean towards Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys and things like that. So I think for this record, I, I there wasn't a lot of I don't know what I'm gonna do with this song like there was on A Wondrous Life. I with that, it was a lot of I have these cool songs, but I 
I really don't know what I want to do. So each one was a laborious exploration to find the sound. Whereas this one is, is more like, I know what kind of song this is and I'm just going to do each one great. And you know, at least that was my intent. So I guess that's the difference. And part of that is because I, I didn't have it. Not like I was rushing it, but it was, uh, I don't have enough time to just fuck around and, and you know, I, I, let's, let's get this record done. Let's do this. I don't need to try every little possible patch on every little thing anymore. If that makes sense. <laughs> it, it makes sense. Yeah. And I, I, I think it'd be too far to say it's down and dirty cause it's not down and dirty. It's not yeah. like you just said, there's no, you know, you just came in the studio. It's, it's second take. It's done. It's not that. No, no. I, I, I spent the same amount of hours, uh, just less hours. I think, um, endlessly experimenting yeah fiddling with it a bit yeah. i think it was more focused yeah um yeah and it's also it, it is a little bit dirty i mean I, I i add dirt a lot and and uh when i sent it to i had to use a different mastering engineer than i usually use and he called me up and he said you know there's a your vocals are distorted and you know are you sure the, and i'm like yeah i, I have I made them that way. You know, I, it was all, there's a reason why they're distorted. It works in the song. And so we had to sort a few things out, but yeah. So there's seven, seven new songs, but the, then you did a cover of Flickering, right? Uh, or that, that's a live cover of it though. Yeah. Uh, there was a, I, I hate to say it, but I, I was like, well, first it was just going to be six songs because I had six songs in the can and then I had one of those days where I wrote, uh, I wrote a song fairly quickly, um, only the wicked run. Yeah. And I just loved the lyrics on it. And I said, I need to put this on the record. And I made a, a very stripped down production. And then you can't have an LP with four songs on one side and three on the other. I mean, that, right. <laughs> that's like, you, you just can't do that. Uh, so I needed an eighth song and I, I, literally had to ship out the masters like in a day or so. So I was just going through, I didn't, I, I didn't have another acoustic song to just crank on there. I didn't want to do that. And uh, I was looking through live performances and unreleased stuff. And I stumbled on this one performance that I always liked of flickering because I think it was the record release party for for flickering and it just really captured the the real essence of the song because it was fresh hmm. and um i had most of the same players uh that recorded it and the room was this packed room in san francisco and the vibe it's just somebody's cell phone it was just on a cell phone is that right oh my gosh and um and and, it, and, all, and then also uh, the woman who was singing with me, she had since died of cancer. Oh. And uh, so there was just a lot of, there was just a lot of good feeling on it. And I'm like, I wonder if I can just kind of, you know, extract, extract it from this YouTube video and the audio and, and get it sounding as good as I can possibly get it. And so it's, it's not great quality, but I think the performance for me, I'm glad it's immortalized. And, um, and it also reminds me a little bit of, you know, I was a big Neil Young fan and some of his stuff in the seventies, you know, he, he would throw on some pretty obscure tracks on records, you know, like where did this come from? You know, they weren't studio recordings. They were just things that he felt like putting on the record. So I felt like it was in that vein. I loved it. Of course, again, you can make fun of me again because I do realize you do have other albums since Flickering, but I love that song. So I was really tickled when you shared with me. I, I'm never going to play it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you played it in Kansas City too. And I just was, oh, I was just so excited. Is there any way you can share some music today that I can yeah. drop into this? Or do you want to yeah, play I, something or what do you yeah, want to do? I'm, not, I'm happy to play, but I need to get a glass of water. Why don't you do that? All right. I'll be back in two seconds. Hello, this is Euro Satan, and you are listening to Mysterious Goings On. As they say, the devil is in the detail, and I say the detail is in this devil. Which one do you want to do? I'll do Jagged Tooth. Oh, oh, really? So if anything, if I were, you know, a big fancy uh, A&R man, I would be like, definitely, definitely Jagged Tooth would be a single, and definitely The Lockdown. 
Do you even think about singles anymore that way? Do you think of it that way? Because nobody, as you said to me three years ago, nobody buys albums quite the same way anymore. It's just they hear one song maybe. Or how do you how do you even go there? Well, it is. I think it's kind of almost all about singles these days. It's Spotify and singles. So the you know the idea is to release a couple of singles before the LP. So the the second single will be. Uh, no translation for no the the second song on the oh, record that's a great one yeah yeah so um that'll that'll come out august first or i think i i think um and uh so i don't i mean i don't write singles but you know you you can kind of you can get a, t a, a sense of what's the yeah kind of the popular one or whatever mm -hmm. um yeah yeah I, I yeah i don't think anybody who listened to hollow notes private eyes album thought anything on the second side yeah, was a single. So uh, let me shut up for a minute and let Mickelson sing his latest, Jagged Tooth. Asking about who we know and the back of my claim. I'm out here on furlough, serving 30 years for selling half off, but doubling the price. I asked the wrong person for the right advice. I was doing my best to tell you the truth, but every time I cut my tongue on this jagged tooth Jagged tooth I was uh, I didn't mind losing the wife but I did mind losing the house in my upright piano and the rest of my backbone. I swore I would learn to play, start a band with a new Billy Joe. Maybe you can take me again for everything that I own. I was doing my best to tell you the truth. But every time I cut my tongue on this jagged tooth. Jagged tooth. My eyes these are pressed by the lack of curiosity I'm a crisis of my own making Don't see together the words I've said It's like putting a band-aid on a broken leg City by domesticated people, they taught me survival. How to beg, how to borrow. So you need to be careful. I may be a moral, my halls are filled with dreams I've killed, and the people who live there in life are in peril. I was doing my best to tell you. But every time I cut my tongue on this jagged tooth, I was doing my 
Fantastic. Jagged Tooth. Mickelson from the latest album coming out August 15th, Drowning in an Inflatable Pool. That was Jagged Tooth. Uh, sometimes I remember the words, sometimes I don't. Yeah. Well, you know, you can be forgiven. It's not like it's flickering. <laughs> By the way, could you do flickering? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's, it's weird. This, this playing it, not in front of like actual audiences, it's really hard. It's, it's just weird because it's like you're... I'm in my office, you know, my phone buzzes. So I look right. at the phone. It's just, it, you know, I get distracted. It's, it's just, it sucks not playing live. It really. That's something I wanted to ask you about because you've been doing a fair amount of Facebook lives and, and et cetera, doing that. And, and it's hard because you don't get that feedback and, or you do get the feedback and it's the, it's the, scrolling comments but that's i do a live thing once a week it's a it's a cocktail thing it's silly i make drinks and i try to tell jokes but i have to read what people are saying while i'm trying to mix drinks so i can't imagine trying to strum the guitar remember the lyrics oh and look over and see what gloria said i'm blind and, without my glasses anyway i couldn't read it anyway oh well there you go you know it's it's it's, it's a whole production but it's yet another uh, skill set you've had to add on top of being a producer singer songwriter uh touring artist all those things this is the thing I wanted to get to, though. Do you think that once, and I think it will be under control eventually, do you think once this virus is under control and we can move about freely amongst uh, the, the, the states and the nations, do you, do you see yourself, though, continuing to do that kind of outreach in addition to touring? When you when you say in addition to what outreach are you talking about? It's a bit like Facebook Lives and oh, uh, I don't you know what I I don't know. I think what I what I did enjoy doing is um, making the video like the how to video and doing like other things just because right. I have the time. Yeah. Um, so that was I could see myself doing more video kind of stuff because it's it's just another outlet. You know the, the other thing about doing the the Facebook Live or these live in this, you know, at home clips is there's no adrenaline. And I think that's what, what I, you know, when you go out in front of an audience, even if it's two people, you get a, a burst of adrenaline and that does triggers things in your brain and it opens up your voice. There's a whole physical reaction. And when you're just doing it in your rehearsal room or in my control room, I have zero adrenaline and it's just, it's harder to play. It's harder to sing. It's, it's just, it, it's, uh, I guess it's like having sex with a condom. I don't know. <laughs> but um, it's just not the same. Well, no, I used to be an actor and, and I, I always felt like I, I was a solar panel and the audience was the sun. And if, uh, if, the, if you know, if there's no sun, you, you're just a low energy. You're just, you, it's hard. I always needed to draw on that. And I also, and I, I'm almost positive you're going to agree with me on this almost, but I mean, your performance can change even in a tiny way, just based on how the audience seems to be reacting. Like to, to me as an actor, like if I delivered a line a certain way, I could feel that. And it might Absolutely. be, a, right? Is it, you know, maybe it's a different line reading at the matinee the next day and the audience reacted a little differently and you can kind of adjust. Yeah. But when you're staring at a, a little tiny camera on your computer, it, it's all flat affect. It, it is. It's no, and I mean, I do the best I can. I don't, I don't, but I dash it. I do it because I need to. Right. I need to keep doing stuff and, but I, I can't say I enjoy it. It's really like I have to force myself to do it as opposed to, you know, I'll play anywhere if they, you know, if, if anybody wants to hear me, but it's, I don't know. Uh, to, uh, as far as doing that, I, I don't know. I, maybe if broadcasting live, I guess um, if there was, if we could do stuff, uh, I mean, it's been suggested to me because I have a, a nice studio with a nice, big room with high ceilings for, you know, maybe doing some kind of a live thing, a live broadcast with musicians and mm -hmm. interviews. Uh, I could see maybe doing something more like that, where it's a little more interactive with other people, uh, you know, in the okay. same room with me. So I'm not by myself. <laughs> kind of like a, a live from Daryl's house kind of thing. I could see yeah. you doing that. You would be great yeah. at that. Um, 
I know? would love it if you because that see that's what I'm trying yeah, to get at. Have a thing for Hall and Oates. You, you, I love Hall and Oates, man. Are you oh, kidding hey, me? Yeah. I'm you're sorry. Gonna, come on, Daryl Hall. Come on, really? You're gonna say come on that voice? Come on. No, he's a great. He's a great singer. Very talented. <laughs> no, actually, but but he had line from Daryl's house. What I love about that is like he would always. And he's got this big kind of area and he would he would have his his session people with him and then they'd cycle in a new band. It just seems to me in San Francisco, once things are opened up again, if you have a space, maybe every month or every quarter you might do something similar. Nichols um, house, yeah. Yeah, I'm well, serious. I, I, I have thought about it because the first of all, musicians have to be nice to me first. And when that happens, um, I'll consider doing it. But the uh, uh, <laughs> I have <laughs> Because I could also at the same time, you know, make professional uh, mixes of it. So it's, so it, it would be a good thing to have. Yeah, it's a good idea. I, I'll, I'll think about that right now. I hope I you will. I hope you will. It's just, I'm just trying to think that, yes, we've got this, here comes the horrible cliche, new normal. But, you know, I'm going to be bringing things. I'm going to be bringing some things from this to what I'm doing in the future. I have to. I don't even just mean my writing. I'm talking about my day job, all that. So all this stuff, you know, I did a little bit of this before, but now it's like you, I'm, it's, it's how I'm making my living to a degree. Um, so I was curious about that. So I want to ask you. How much do I have to pay for this? Uh, we'll work that out later. Usually, right. usually I'm pretty cheap. And I think you've already given me a free download of your, your, your album. So I'm, I think we're good. Yeah, but um, you, you only listen to flickering. So <laughs> no, lately though, it's been wondrous life. So ah. I'll get onto this one in about a year. <laughs> no, I wonder, we, there was something we did cover last time that I've just, I've got to catch you up on real quick here. Cause we talked about the business and Forgive me if I if I got this wrong. I re-listened to the interview today when I was hiking. We talked about how the music business changed and how you said there, you know, there is no music business as it was even 10 years ago. You said something like that. And you said now it's all Spotify and it's this. And and you know, Spotify kind of has a spotty record of taking care of the artists anyway. But now I'm seeing that you're really, uh, are you having to lean more into Spotify just to, to, to get it? Or how's that going in the relationship? Well, I mean, the Really, the, the music business, at least from how I see it, is right now it's Spotify, YouTube, Instagram. It's social networking. It's, um, you know, people. I fought the whole Spotify transition because I'm old. And uh, it was really hard to all of a sudden see music uh, become a free, a free thing. It okay. just, you know, and... I know, at least from my experience, and I'm sure many others, once Spotify came out, no more CDs got sold. Yeah. And once people start expecting music to be free, it, it completely loses value. I mean, if, if, if you were allowed to go into the cinemas and it was free, or you spent $5 a month and you could just go see any movie anywhere, anytime, as many times as you wanted, why would you ever pay thirteen dollars to go see a movie again? It 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 can't go back, and it's just how it is. It's it, 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 it evolved into that, and no, you can't make money on Spotify, and uh, so it's just the exposure. And then what that was doing it was it was it was reaching new audiences, and, and it it could help with touring, um, but like everything else in social networking it's all manipulated in numbers. So you can, you know, you pay to play. If you want more plays on Spotify, you pay for it. If you want more followers on this, you pay for it. You, you pay for it one way or another. You pay for it uh, by hiring promoters or, you know, or flat out buying plays and things like that. Wow. So, I mean, like if I really wanted a hundred thousand plays of a song, I could just pay for it and it would happen. So it's a lot of, it's all bullshit really. I mean, there are those who do, of course, uh, they, they catch on and they, people do go viral and things like that. I'm not saying sure. that doesn't happen, but right. it's, all, it's all pay to play and it's all an illusion. A lot of this stuff. I mean, you could, you could have a, you know, a, a million followers and thousands and thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of plays and no one will show up at your show. They don't necessarily, it's not real. Right. Um, so, and I guess the the way you could combat that is you could say, not combat, but you could um, debate that would be back in the heyday of the music business in order to get press and get radio play, the labels were paying for it. Yeah. You know, so, payola, payola, right? So it's, it's, the only difference is now is it's, 
it's a do-it-yourself pay oil. You know, once the DIY uh, world and anybody with a computer can make any sound and upload it to iTunes and Spotify. Yeah. Um, and of course, markets develop and people know, hey, I bet those people will pay me if I can get them a hundred more plays of that. And, you know, it's just how it is. Yeah. Between that and the game showification of new artistry, I mean, the, the whole, uh, all the game shows of, you know, the voice and all that. So I don't know how you feel about those things. I, I don't particularly love that. I kind of like the idea of maybe not winning a contest to be to discovered. I, I kind of like the idea uh, and I'm not a musician, wish I was, but I, I just don't have that ability. But I kind of like the idea of, of working, toiling, uh, honing my craft for years even, and, and then maybe making it rather than winning a game show. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. I don't, how do you feel about that stuff? I, mean, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't sing cover songs. That's just my own thing. So that's, I guess, I have a different point of view. And obviously, I'm in the minority of that. But I actually don't see anything harmful about the you know those kinds of shows it's entertainment it's a tv mm -hmm. show you know you can find i know people who have been on them and who have auditions and they give you a list of songs to choose from and you sign over all your rights and and it's fine i mean it's like a it's just a talent show I, yeah it's a heavily marketed talent show there's nothing wrong with it i, I don't have an issue with that i mean it's it, it, it you know the kind of music these people end up doing, it, it suits that audience. So it's not, I don't that's really a great way, That's a great way to think about it. I guess I just, I just think that the, that all the, th I, well, I'm an old man too. And I just think a lot of the things that I grew up believing about the business and about music, it just all seems to be a little bit under assault. Not that there weren't game shows and talent shows from since TV began it's, and yeah. radio, but I just, I don't know. To me, to me, it just seems so, so transparently awful. But again, you're right. And there are some good artists who, have definitely made a career doing that. So, you know. I also think they may that those shows may have been a catalyst for so much music. It's cover music now. So many artists just do covers, and yeah, uh, it. I guess there's nothing really wrong with it. It just maybe that. I don't know. I mean, I, I know people who have done recently whole albums of just cover songs, and I don't know. I think I mean, it's just not my thing. It's not my thing. It's one thing to do a cover song. You're doing an interpretation, but it's, it all becomes, the more everything becomes the same, the less right. special things are. And I do what I do when I want, how I want. And that's why I'm the roaring success I am. And I guess that sadly, that means there will not be a, a Mickelson cover album of Hall & Oates Greatest Hits. An only man eater. I'm just gonna do that song twelve different ways. The reggae version, the EDM version. <laughs> oh man. Okay, I, I know we're getting closer to our time, but before we go, so it's coming out. It's the drowning in um drowning uh, in inflatable, inflatable pool on coming August fifteenth. Now this show will air. This show will will post a week from today. Today's the fifteenth. We're recording of July. It'll be out on Thursday. A week from tomorrow. A week from Thursday. So we'll be a little bit ahead of everything. But what? When was the date of the uh, the, the animated uh, video? The animated video is July twenty third. Okay, we might That's just be right around there. Drops on Spotify and iTunes on the twenty fifth. Okay, and I have all those links of all your various platforms. I'll put it in the show notes, everybody. In addition, I'll have links to Scott's uh, initial interview here on MGO. That one's kind of fun to listen to because I'm clearly hungover when I'm, I'm uh, doing I think it. both. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I don't care. Was, I learned a lot from you. It was good. Before I let you go, though, any, any last words uh, that you'd like to share with everybody, all the listeners? I, I, you've been so generous with your time and your thoughts today. Oh, I really appreciate uh, you reaching out and saying you touch with me and the support you, Alex, who have given me over the years. It means a lot. And, you know, I, I hope that uh, the listeners and regardless of, of your political uh, bent that, you know, six months from now, we're, we find ourselves in a more optimistic place and, and uh, things can and will get better. We just have to be good to each other and ourselves until then. I couldn't agree more. Remember, it's MickelsonMusic.com. 
The link is in the show notes. From there, you can find everything. I would highly recommend you follow him on Spotify, follow him on SoundCloud, follow him on YouTube. All those links will be there and on Facebook. And by the way, when he does these live events, it's give him some love, show up, say something, put it in all caps so he can see it with his glasses off. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we'll do that. But Scott Mickelson, uh, thanks so much for being on Mysterious Goings On. We will catch you hopefully before your next album. Maybe I'll just uh, try and Shanghai you sometime and just say, how the hell are you for five minutes sometime? That would be great anytime. Thank you so much. All right, my brother. And thank you, listeners. Remember, the show notes will be at mgopod.com. There's also some links where you can become, not a subscriber, but just a supporter. Maybe throw some money in the tip jar, help keep things going here. You know, uh, baby's got to need new pair of shoes, that kind of stuff. So mgopod.com. And of course, you will find the complete back catalog of episodes since right around 2016 when we debuted this show. Now, and until next, time keep reading from regular expenses to occasional splurges there's a lot to buy why not get cash back every time you spend with the PenFed power cash rewards card you get cash back on every purchase that's everywhere every time you use it you can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days visit penfed.org slash power cash to apply to receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. T-Mobile has been building America's largest 5G network for this epic 5G moment. And I want it now. Introducing the new iPhone 12 Pro, now at T-Mobile, the leader in 5G coverage. Download, upload, and game at 5G speed in more places. Unleash the power of iPhone 12 Pro with T-Mobile. <laughs> Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan or feature. See T-Mobile.com.